Hello, my name is Joseph Plasic, and I'm a health data scientist. I work with, I help turn clinical data into aha moments for doctors. I work with data to help hospitals improve their care processes by optimizing the computer systems that doctors, nurses, pharmacists, therapists, and other healthcare practitioners use. Um, in the end, the work of health data scientists helps provide higher quality healthcare by bringing evidence based care to the bedside. Uh, my background is in computer science. Um, so when presented with a new clinical problem, I aim to gain a deep understanding of the disease, uh, which I do by reading the literature, taking courses, or even rounding with doctors as they see patients to get an idea of the workflow and information needs. Um, today, I want to look at an example illustrating the importance of interdisciplinary collaboration in informatics and data science related to adverse drug events. Today's talk is designed to be at an introductory level. Um, this talk primarily focuses on the data preparation steps and doesn't get into any of the details of the natural language processing models or machine learning models that are applied later in the study. As a disclosure, this project, Identifying Adverse Drug Events in Ambulatory Primary Care Clinical Notes, is a collaboration between Brigham and Women's Hospital and IBM with financial support from IBM. IBM partners with academic leaders to advance the science of artificial intelligence. In today's talk, I will be discussing the annotation process and sampling plan development of an ongoing study on the prevalence of adverse drug events. So the short uh, version of the talk is this. So adverse drug events or ADEs are described as unintended and harmful effects resulting from medication use that are associated with suboptimal patient outcomes and increased health services utilization. They may or may not result from an error and are classified as non-preventable, preventable and ameliorable ADEs. Natural language processing models or NLP, often require a large collection of documents for training purposes. So annotating a random set of notes um, from something that has low prevalence, uh, in other words, it's relatively rare, uh, will result in a biased or imbalanced data set. And so we need to account for this when we're training uh, machine learning based methods. Ideally, the data set would be balanced, such as a 50-50 split between cases and controls. In curating a cohort, our goal is then to create an annotated data set that is both balanced as well as diverse, so it represents both the common and the rare adverse drug events. Conducting a sampling study prior to annotation can help us envision a path that make uh, to make that goal a reality. Um, in this way, we can sample notes that are more likely to contain adverse drug events in order to optimize the efforts of our clinical annotation team. And we can also uh, pre-annotate those as well um, and try to achieve some more efficiencies that way. So there are several tasks in particular where uh, clinician input is desirable, such as cohort identification, as these are areas where clinical expertise and knowledge of workflows is essential. Supervised machine learning methods um, require annotation, annotated data, and to get high quality annotations, we need annotators who are expert in a particular clinical subject area that we're annotating for. Clinicians are on the front lines of patient care and know what's really going on in that patient care environment. They're essential to ensure quality in the clinical nat natural language processing systems we create. So before I get into the details, I'm gonna step back and talk about clinical data from the perspective of a health informaticist. So the first, thing to look at is what's the difference between data, information, and knowledge? Uh, in this case, um, data is an item or event out of context with no relation to other things. For example, 
it's raining outside or it, the sun is shining. Um, information is a representation of relationships between data. For example, the temperature dropped 15 degrees and then it started raining. Knowledge is a representation of patterns among data and information. These patterns don't actually constitute knowledge until they are understood. For example, if the humidity is high and the temperature drops substantially, the atmosphere is unlikely to be able to hold the moisture so it rains. So my job as a health data scientist is to transform data into actual knowledge for healthcare providers. Now there's a few steps uh, beyond that knowledge um, that, that we need before we can get to the bedside or to, to practice. And so the first is we need to have an insight um, and that insight, from that insight, we can generate wisdom. And so wisdom is the recognition that knowledge patterns arise from fundamental principles and the understanding of what those principles are. For example, it rains because it rains. And this encompasses my understanding of all the interactions that happened between raining, evaporation, air currents, temperature gradients, uh, changes um, in uh, the climate. And so then to get to that action or practice, Ideally, the discoveries that I make as a health data scientist will end up being used by doctors at the bedside. Um, and the action taken is based on understanding of that knowledge and context. For example, I bring a raincoat or umbrella with me when I think it's about to rain. Um, so to summarize, I sort through and mine the data generated by doctors in order to enhance uh, clinical decision making. So what are some characteristics of clinical data? So the main characteristic that makes data big is its sheer volume, often on the order of millions of records. Um, we have millions of patients uh, at Mass General Brigham, um, where I, I work currently. Um, but sometimes we work with small data when we consider rare diseases. Uh, certainly, doctors hope that the data collect uh, provides value and is clinically relevant for future use. Um, and, and not just for billing purposes, uh, but for helping them make better decisions in the future uh, for this patient or for other patients. Velocity refers to high speed processing. And so this is particularly important uh, for real time clinical decision support. Uh, so, so we need to have high velocity. Um, to um, be able to analyze uh, sort of these high patterns uh, in, um, for example, the mechanical ventilation data that are coming in to see how that patient changes dynamically over time. In my research on adverse drug events, I deal with a variety of structured and free text data sources like medications, um, laboratory data, clinical data, and billing data. Veracity refers to the trustworthiness or quality of data. How much uh, do you trust the data coming from uncontrolled environments? Um, for example, patient data, uh, patient-created data. Uh, clinical data has variability due to seasonal health effects and disease evolution and the non-deterministic nature of health. Adverse drug events are important in the context of patient safety. In 2000, the Institution of Medicine put out a report called To, to Air is Human, uh, which highlighted the high prevalence of preventable medical errors in current practice and help to shift care to be more team-based and patient-centric. Care increasingly has focus on prevention, which tends to be conducted in the outpatient or ambulatory setting. The widespread use of electronic health record systems in care settings has made it easier to identify potential errors such as adverse drug events. 
medical errors rank among the top causes of death. As a growing health concern, identifying um, adverse drug events can lead to improvements in patient safety and quality of care. Still, it's unclear whether changes in technology, delivery and management, and payment models have led to an overall improvement in patient safety and quality of care over the last two decades. Here are some examples of what we're talking about in terms of adverse drug events. For example, analgesic overuse headaches, drug-induced hypotension, anaphylactic shock due to the adverse effect of a drug, um, and several others here. Prior research in this area has suggested that clinical notes um, from patient encounters with certain international classification of disease uh, billing codes, uh, in this case ICD-10, are more likely to contain adverse drug events. We found that a systematic review by Hole et al. contained the most comprehensive list of terms at a high level of granularity. So ICD-10 is a hierarchical terminology and so we compared this list to a list at our institution and found that adding in the more specific terms that are lower, that are lower in the hierarchy should also uh, occur because that's how they are stored in our, H our electronic health record system. Um, and so we have this high level code T88.6. Um, but we also include the lower level code T88.6XXA because um, that's how it's stored in our electronic health record system. And we don't want to miss um, that potentially important data. So Hole et al. Uh, classified the identified ICD-10 billing codes into causality categories ranging from codes that contain the phrase induced by medication or poisoning by medication to adverse drug events that are very likely all the way to adverse drug events that are unlikely. Um, this subset represents a very uh, small portion of ICD-10, which has about 68,000 codes uh, total. And so they're about 830 codes encode, encoded here in whole et al. Um, so that's just a very small portion of all of the potential billing codes. So what, what's the gap in knowledge that we're looking at here? Well, one study found 6.5% of all hospitalized patients experienced an adverse drug event. However, uh, compared with events occurring in the inpatient setting, much less is known about adverse drug events that occur in the outpatient or ambulatory setting. So substantial variability exists in the methods used to detect and identify these events. And the exact prevalence of adverse drug events in the outpatient setting is unknown with estimates ranging from five to 35% annually. Uh, electronic health record systems and computational methods to analyze them, such as natural language processing tools, have been used to improve reliability of identifying adverse drug events in prior studies. So our setting for this study is at Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, Brigham and Women's Faulkner Hospital, the Brigham and Women's Physicians Organization, and many related facilities and programs. Um, Brigham and Women's is a global leader in creating a healthier world. Uh, with over more than 1,000 inpatient beds, approximately 60,000 inpatient stays, and 1.7 million outpatient encounters annually, Brigham's 1,200 physicians provide expert care and virtually every medical and surgical specialty to patients locally, regionally, and around the world. Boston-based Brigham and Women's Hospital is affiliated with Harvard Medical 
and a founding member of Mass General Brigham, a large integrated healthcare network. US News and World Reports consistently ranks Brigham and Women's Hospital among the nation's top 10 hospitals. The tool that we're looking at later uh, in this study is one from IBM. Um, in 2011, IBM's computer named Watson won Jeopardy. So Watson is a question answering program that utilizes natural language processing, which is a form of artificial intelligence to retrieve facts uh, within documents and guess an answer. Um, we have a slightly different product that we're analyzing here um, for our study, uh, which is the IBM's annotator for clinical data, ACD, um, which is sort of um, related to that IBM Watson system. So, Good science is collaborative in nature and has rigorous and reproducible methods that minimizes biases. Um, we manage conflicts of interest with transparency and disclosure, but not categorical exclusion through our industry academic collaboration. For our part of the collaboration, Brigham and Women's Hospital has the clinical data, expertise to interpret that data, and a multidisciplinary team of clinicians and data scientists focused on this task. The overall product, project objective is to train and evaluate the ability of IBM's annotator for clinical data uh, products to identify adverse drug events, specifically from uh, outpatient primary care notes. Um, after curating the corpus of notes from the electronic health record system and de-identifying any HIPAA elements, the dual annotation of ADEs by clinicians will take place. And so this corpus will be sent to IBM to train the IBM's annotator for clinical data tool. So annotating a random sample of notes for something that has low prevalence, in other words, is relatively rare, will result in a biased or imbalanced data set, uh, which needs to be accounted for when training using machine learning based methods. So ideally the data set we've got would be balanced, such as a 50-50 split between cases and controls. And so this requires us to sample notes that are more likely to have ADEs in them. So to figure out how to curate the data set uh, to get the distribution um, we need for optimizing the training of the NLP tool, uh, we conducted a sampling study. So we utilized an iterative process to investigate the prevalence of adverse drug events within our outpatient clinical notes. This consisted of several steps. First, to determine the prevalence of encounters with relevant billing codes by causality category. Uh, second, to determine the prevalence of clinical notes within each causality category that describe an ADE. The third step is to create a sampling plan for corpus curation that is both balanced in terms of cases and controls, as well as diverse. So it includes both the rare and the common adverse drug events through upsampling or downsampling of causality categories or specific ICD-10 codes of interest. So first we looked at the prevalence of billing codes within the causality court categories used in the whole et al study. And so we conducted an initial sampling study using ambulatory encounters uh, between October 2018 through December 2019 uh, using those um, codes that we had previously identified and expanded to include the lower granular terms. Um, and so we captured the distribution uh, of these causality categories. In this particular data set, uh, we had about 656,000 encounters uh, with these ICD-10 codes of interest, um, which represents about 14.9% of encounters that had a diagnosis associated with them, and 11.6% of all ambulatory encounters. 
at our organization. So our organization has about 1.7 million outpatient encounters annually. And so we identified about 656,000 encounters within this 1.25 years that we investigated that were associated with the billing codes of interest. And those uh, categorized as ADE possible account for 62% of the visits associated with one of the 292 ICD-10 codes mapped to category E. Another 18% uh, were in that ADE likely category or category D, um, which corresponds to about 137 ICD-10 diagnosis codes. And so this gives us a starting point to investigate each category uh, further. We have another project on the M-Terms lab that's focused on rare, severe cutaneous adverse reactions or SCAR. And so the SCAR adverse drug events cover four disease diagnoses. So SJS, 10, AGEP, and DRESS. We found that uh, dress or drug rash with encephalophilia and systematic syndrome was not in our original whole uh, set of ICD-10 codes. And so um, we had to add this code in. And we found that these were not very prevalent with our sample. Uh, which is expected because these are relatively rare uh, diagnoses and rare clinical events, um, especially in the ambulatory setting. So we sampled 218 notes from one week of encounters, and these were stratified by the causality category um, as part of a classification task. Notes were classified as either yes, no, or maybe containing an uh, adverse drug event. As you can see, the percentage of ADs sampled varied by category. Um, and within the A1 category, for example, we had 67 to 90% um, of AD, E of uh, these notes representing an ADE encounter, um, if we counted the maybes as yes or no. And so the B1s, we had 80 to 85% uh, would be considered uh, ADE. The Cs, it was in the 40, 70% range. Um, the Ds and Es were about 4 to 8%. Um, we reclassified the 19 maybes in the later step um when we focus on defining our annotation schema so ades are potentially documented in visits that aren't associated with diagnoses previously studied um, so this step needs a little bit more investigation however we anticipate that prevalence of ades within these notes is extremely low, and we can likely exclude encounters if the patient does not have any medications on their structured medication list. Um, we will use natural language processing to screen the notes for from these encounters to identify medications and adverse reactions in order to find a subset that are likely to contain adverse drug events. So, Dem Terms Lab has a linguistics focused tool called M Terms which has been previously validated on the task of medication extraction and adverse reactions extraction. And so we will use that tool to try to pre-annotate and pre-screen uh, this set of notes. How much do we need to annotate anyways? Well, that depends on your sample size calculations. For example, there are sample size calculations calculators available for 
um, kappa, as well as other statistics that you'll be calculating. Be sure to calculate these so you're annotating enough data that your system has statistical power, but not so much that you're wasting time and money. I won't go into details about these calculations here, uh, but it's something to be aware of. For the ADE corpus, we plan to an dual annotate a corpus of around 3,000 to 5,000 notes uh, using multiple annotators. So our sampling plan has a total of 1,480 E's, um, giving us a balanced sample with approximately a 50-50 ratio of ADEs, and we can use this for training purposes. We'll define our targets um, as we, or refine our targets as we annotate the corpus. Um, let's talk about the annotation process by going through um, some examples of how one might get started. So the first task is to highlight everything that a clinician would find important or interesting as it relates to adverse drug events within a clinical note. In this task, uh, information is hidden within unstructured clinical notes. And so domain experts, in this case clinicians, help us to identify what is relevant. Uh, so take a moment and highlight anything in this passage that you think would be important or interesting related to adverse drug events. So in this first class, um, different annotators may highlight totally different concepts, which is expected. And so we repeat this task on another 10 to 20 clinical notes in order to gather enough examples to begin formulating a code book or annotation schema. Um, in this particular case, I highlighted seizures, it's an ADE, Ritalin is a drug, uh, thaliomide is a drug, Create relationships between the ADEs and the drugs, as well as highlighted um, phenytoin and prophylaxis as a drug reason um, combination. And so in the code book, uh, we will add in specific definitions for each concept, including inclusion exclusion criteria. Uh, to find rules or windows or spans, which refer to how long of text to extract. Um, and we define the span for each concept to include everything that makes it a standalone concept. So once the code book is created, we re-annotate the first set of notes to see if any changes would have been made in the annotations. Um, and so this will help us sanity check that the code book is consistent with the initial annotations in the areas that make sense. So now that we have a code book, our task, our next task would be to bring in a second set of annotators um, and to train them on our initial set of rules, compare results and update the code book as necessary. Once this initial training is complete, uh, it's time to test the code book and compare our annotation against theirs on a small batch, 10 to 20 notes. So it depends on the size and of the notes and the time it takes to go through that set. Um, most likely won't have 100% agreement at this step, which is why it's important to pause, compare results intermittently, update the code book so that all annotators are using the same criteria and are interpreting those criteria in the same way. To make comparison easier, uh, we will build the code book into 
and conduct annotations in a specialized annotation tool. Uh, in this course, we're using a tool called Brat, um, which looks like what we have on the bottom here. Crowdsourcing annotations from something like Amazon Turk is another option for annotation tasks when the clinical data is de-identified. And this approach has been trained to produce reliable results. Though participants likely don't have the clinical expertise necessary to produce uh, valid results if the task requires substantial clinical knowledge, like our adverse drug event example. However, more annotators doesn't necessarily improve the quality of annotations, that's the quantity and speed at which they can be found. So once we have a valid codebook and trained annotators, it's time to annotate a lot of documents. Um, during each batch of documents, 20 to 100, uh, the codebook should remain set and each annotator annotates on their own against that codebook. It's extremely important that Assessments are conducted independently and annotators do not discuss the annotations with fellow annotators during each coding batch so that the definitions of the codebook, which are considered the gold, gold standard. So we don't want uh, contamination because contamination this step is failure and all of the annotators work will need to be thrown out. So outliers will influence, um, with influence may indicate an error or perhaps another population that hasn't been previously considered. I don't hear you, Joseph. You're your mute. Sorry. Um, with all this in mind, uh, this is the initial proposed annotation schema, including entities, relationships uh, between those entities and modifiers. And so this will be uh, developed based on previous work in ADE identification using annotation schemas from the NTC2 challenge and the MADE 1.0 challenge. So here's an example, um, another example. So we have uh, two drugs, um, Merlinone and Lasix, and those are both have a relationship with an ADE, creatinine bump, uh, with a biomarker of 3.0. In 2018, uh, N2C2 conducted a NLP challenge um, that annotated aspects of the drug signature to see how the field had progressed since the 2009 ITP2 medication challenge. Um, ADE was the added component in this 2018 study. Uh, the MADE 1.0 um, challenge is uh, Another challenge that occurred recently um, that was based more on the oncology data, the N2C2 challenge was based on inpatient data. Um, and so may have had this concept for other sign symptom disease. Um, and so that is uh, not annotated as an indication or ADE. And these frequently occurred in the history section of the note, such as a headache in the back of the head. Based on our clinical expertise, 
not all of the aspects of the drug signatures were deemed relevant to ADE identification and were thus excluded. Um, and so we filtered down this initial schema to just the relevant aspects that we were interested in studying for this particular challenge. Um, and, and so, yeah. Here's what, what our pilot study um, annotation schema diagram looks like. And so, and to, to entity relationship or ER diagrams are a useful way to represent annotation schemas in a visual way. Entities which are represented by rectangles are the concepts of interest. So relationships are represented by the diamond shapes and they show how two entities are related or share information. Attributes um, represented by ovals and ER diagrams uh, contain key attributes that are unique distinguishing characteristics of the entity. Uh, in this case, all attributes in this diagram are implicit, uh, representing a default assumption that all ADEs are active and about the patient. We conducted a small pilot study with about 90 notes, um, 30 of which came from the NTUC2 challenge. Um, that focused on only a small set, a subset of the aspects of the drug signature in order to capture only aspects that may be clinically useful to identify adverse drug events. We also specified that these ADEs must be active about this particular patient um, and other annotations must uh, present implicit or explicit evidence of the adverse drug event. So we're not annotating every single drug, we're just annotating those drugs that are related to an adverse drug event. Um, during this iterative pilot study, we identified that ADEs were different from adverse drug withdrawal events or ADWEs. And so we created a new entity for ADWE. Upon review of the pilot study, we decided to add it back in attributes um, for resolved ADEs and relevant ADEs um, that were not the focus of this particular visit. So adverse withdrawal events are described as a set of clinical symptoms related to the removal or decreasing of drug. So we have a physiological withdrawal reaction, a rebound, hypertension, discontinuation syndrome, or opiate um, DC leading to withdrawal. So these are um, withdrawal events. So when looking at the um, ADEs and ADWEs, um, there were several cases that we excluded. For example, skin tests or oral uh, drug challenge orders or notes saying one was performed, um, but that did not include the results. Um, these uh, didn't really give evidence for an ADE or ADWE being present. Um, recurrent C. diff that was not documented slash stated to be drug induced in the clinical notes. Uh, cases where it's unclear, such as the note states that there's renal insufficiency, um, considering DC Lasix and reducing lisinopril due to that, as they could exacerbate, but unknown if uh, believed to be the cause. Cases where the provider is concerned about all the psych meds or polypharmacy and their potential ADEs, um, but that do not include an ADE manifestation, um, and also about uh, lorazepam dependence or overuse uh, concerns. Therapeutic optimization, such as having uh, the end dose wearing off of the Parkinson's medications, which results into a, a medication change um, symptoms or dyskinesis at the early stages of the dosing interval 
uh, due to increased levels or failure to add medications uh, to control blood pressure um, when it's been high for a while. So there's this uh, clinical inertia stuff. Um, unoptimized ther therapy, uh, such as undergoing therapeutic changes after having dyskinesis during a dosing interval um, with L-DOPA. Uh, let's talk about how to assess interrelator reliability for a moment, uh, which is how you assess whether or not you're pro producing reproducible annotations in the same way that other people with similar expertise would. Kappa is uh, basically the standard form of formula for assessing interrelator reliability between annotators. Cohen's Kappa is the traditional formulation, uh, which uses two raters. I prefer Fleisch's Kappa, which is just the generalization of Cohen's Kappa, but allows for more than two raters. In any case, uh, we're looking for a Kappa uh, above 80% for most annotation tasks. Um, as this would provide a strong level of agreement. So BRAT and complementary open source packages like BRAT utils are no longer supported or under active development by the community. Um, however, they are still widely used. Uh, if you're looking for a worthy open source package to support uh, building upon BRAT or creating a new open source annotation tool that uses the same .ann file format would be a useful endeavor. In our case, the relationship between ADE and the drug is critical uh, to assess for inner annotator agreement. However, the current open source tooling is insufficient for calculating this metric as Kappa is not supported for relationships um, in the current tooling. One of my next tasks is to develop a calculator uh, using Fleisch's Kappa um, as the statistical formula uh, to capture the agreement for relationships. Um, so what are our next steps? What are we working on now? In 2021, uh, we're working on training the annotators um, on using this annotation schema, extracting the full cohort of clinical notes from the electronic data warehouse, refining the M-terms uh, NLP tool uh, so we can use it for pre-annotation and de-identification of the clinical notes. Um, we need to annotate and de-identify the corpus, um, calculate the, and create this inner annotator calculator um, that we just talked about. In 2022, uh, we work on, continue to work on annotating and de-identifying the corpus, training IBM's ACD tool, evaluating IBM's ACD tool, and then disseminating our findings. So M-Terms um, is a natural language processing ecosystem uh, that is more of a linguistics focused tool. Um, probably do have other uh, machine learning and deep learning capabilities uh, within the broader ecosystem. Um, so we'll use M-Terms to pre-screen and pre-annotate notes for adverse drug events and medications and we'll use uh, the MTP formulary as well as this whole et al. list for adverse drug events um, for that pre-annotation process. Um, we'll use hidden in plain sight uh, de-identification methods so that the notes will look normal. Um, we need to change all of these dates and ages and locations and numeric sequences and names um, of the 18 HIPAA identifiers. And then we will also manually um, de-identify the uh, notes 
and do the annotations as well. So extracting longitudinal data um, is particularly important for clinical uh, tasks. Um, here's a critical piece of code that has allowed me to extract a time series data set um, for another study of 365 days uh, from an Oracle database. I don't need to do this from my for my current study because we're looking at um, data at the patient encounter level. Um, but here uh, we want to, in this case, we want to capture uh, a new um, capture 365 days worth of data. Um, so so um, let's wrap up here. So some lessons that we've learned so far is that not everything that has a relevant billing code corresponds to an adverse drug event. And so there are particular clinical workflows for ordering skin tests that require an ICD-10 code for billing purposes, but um, the results of these skin tests are unknown. So the M-Terms lab is focused on the application of health information technologies such as natural language processing to clinical practice. For example, the NLP systems created in our lab have been integrated into our organization's electronic health record system for tasks such as medication reconciliation. The NLP tools developed in the M-Terms lab range from linguistics-focused tools such as regular expressions and ontology-based tools for statistics uh, focused on utilizing machine learning, topic modeling, and um, deep learning technologies. I would like to thank my collaborators at Mass General Brigham and IBM Watson Health. In closing, adverse drug events are described as these unintended or harmful effects uh, resulting from medication use that are associated with suboptimal patient outcomes and increased health service utilization. And natural language processing models want a large, diverse uh, set of clinical notes that is balanced and representative of both common and rare adverse drug events for training purposes. And so conducting a sampling study prior to this annotation uh, can help us envision a path to make uh, that goal a reality. Here are some references that may be of interest. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions? So Joseph, this is a great use case of NLP. The one thing I'm curious that have you applied this? Have you thought about applying this to uh, this to uh, vaccines? Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Did you think about using this one in the uh, vaccines for like, especially COVID vaccines? Um, well, there are a few ICD-10 codes uh, for vaccines um, and adverse drug, drug events for vaccines. Um, the challenge with COVID is that it's uh, a very new um, data set. Uh, and so um, in this study, we're primarily looking at uh, the pre-COVID data, um, you could uh, use this sort of um, process to look at the vaccine adverse drug events as well. Um, we're not 
looking at vaccines in this study, uh, although we do have other um, efforts going on at Mass General Brigham uh, that are looking at vaccines. Thank you. That that's really great use. So uh, it is great. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking for your publications from that study. It is quite interesting. There are a lot of use cases that we can take this into. So thank you for your time. And we, we we're gonna broadcast this in the YouTube. It will be in our YouTube channel. Thank you for your time. Thanks everyone for audience. Thanks. So I hope to see you on our next events. Thank you everyone.